Good evening. You're watching the Digital Age. The central thesis, or one of them, of the Digital Age is that terrorism is a consequence and a product of the Digital Age. Why? Because terrorists' ability to create terror is greatly enhanced by the use of the computer. You have a terrorist here and a terrorist there. They don't get in the same room. They're hard to find, and they communicate not through the phone necessarily, but through computers, very hard to detect. It's a central fact of the digital age. And tonight we're going to talk about terrorism, and we're going to talk about this book, A Pretext for War, 9-11 Iraq, and the Abuse of Our Intelligent Agencies. And this book is by our guest tonight, Jim Bamford. Thanks for stopping by, Jim. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Jim. We've had you here before. We've usually talked about the National Security Agency, NSA, because you are thought to be probably the greatest expert outside of the NSA on the NSA because you wrote a book called The Puzzle Palace. Now, this book, you go into virgin territory for you in some respects, I would have thought, for the CIA. But anyway, here's the question for us tonight. Did Bush abuse our intelligence agencies? That's part of the title, and I want to ask you whether you think they did or not, and we'll get to the end of the program, and you can tell us yes or no. So if we're going to talk about abusing the intelligence agencies, we have to figure out what they are. We have the National Security Agency, NSA. The job of the NSA is to break codes, basically, right? Eavesdrop on communications around the world and break codes, right. and then also making codes. Right, but they're the code, the code department. Code and, breakers, that's yeah, right. Yeah, and the CIA is not the code department. There are human spies at human the CIA. Spies. That, so that's, uh, that's the difference. But the CIA uh, is far smaller in terms of uh, their, uh, their, their size and also the amount of intelligence they produce. The NSA produces about 85% of all the intelligence that the it U.S. Does? uses. And the, 85%? Um, about 85%. Not, a, not counting the, uh, the whole overhead imagery of the pictures, but as opposed to the human agents and the eavesdropping, the eavesdropping supplies about 85%. 85%. The human spies for, uh, supply probably less than well, have maybe less 5 or something. 5%. I want to ask you what the other 10% is, sure. but anyway. <laughs> uh, NSA. So let's talk about the NSA. Okay, on a scale of 100, how did the NSA do on... 9-11 and Iraq. Well, it's really a win or lose uh, situation. They lost. They uh, they didn't uh, have any indication of what was happening. Um, they actually during the summer they did have some indications that something was happening, but not anything specific as to when, where, how, or who uh, was going to take place. So, um, you know, in the end, uh, the, the NSA, just like the other intelligence agencies, missed it, and uh, that's led to all the talk about reform and uh, restructuring and uh, criticism, criticism of the intelligence community. The score? Excuse me, my voice left me. You don't want to, so it's zero. Well, in, in, in this case, it's the same as it was during Pearl Harbor. They missed it and they we were attacked. And, uh, well, now, uh, let's, let's be fair to them a little bit. Now, uh, you have some isolated incidents of how they were performing uh, specifically. And one of the uh, stories you tell is the NSA intercepting communications because that's what the NSA does from a, a base in Yemen and can you tell us what the uh, uh, NSA did pretty well on that one what happened that's right. there were a number of successes that NSA yeah. had and this was probably the biggest actually this is probably the biggest success of the entire intelligence community during the uh, lead up to September 11th uh, NSA, as I said, eavesdrops on communications right. around the world. The CIA developed a source uh, who had been involved in the uh, bombing of the embassies in East Africa, a human source. That human source, who had been involved in those bombings, told the CIA that um, uh, one of the key locations that uh, was used as sort of a mailbox or a electronic mailbox, a, um, uh, a place where Al-Qaeda members would call in and find out what's going on and, and make reservations different places. It was sort of a switching area for Al Qaeda members and it was located in Yemen. Uh, so uh, by finding out the location and the phone numbers for this place, the NSA through using its big dishes and its satellites and so forth was able to eavesdrop on the communications going 
in and out of this little building in Yemen, as actually a house in Yemen. And, uh, and in doing that, they found that a number of Al Qaeda members, I think this was around December of 1999, <clears throat> were going to uh, go to um, uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, for a meeting. And so by picking up that information, they were able to tip off the CIA. And the CIA was able to put people in Kuala Lumpur and other places to watch this meeting okay. take place. So that was the uh, initial tip-off. The initial tip-off came from an NSA intercept. So what happened when they, uh, you know, this we're all on computers now. When I started the show many years ago, we weren't. But there's zillions of people on the on a computer, including the NSA. And the NSA, what, it puts that on the uh, secret uh, intelligence uh, computer and it goes to all the agencies? Yeah. And maybe the other agencies look at it or they don't, by the way, but the CIA did. So this was a big triumph. But now, on the failure side, uh, they had bin Laden's uh, cell phone number, didn't they? Well, why they didn't, didn't get why didn't they, Excuse me. Uh, yeah, they did get uh, bin Laden's cell phone uh, and they were eavesdropping on it for, for a number of years, actually from 1996 until 1998, they were actually eavesdropping on bin Laden's uh, satellite phone. He had a uh, satellite phone that was actually provided to him by somebody in the United States. And um, uh, the problem was bin Laden was very sophisticated because he'd, he'd already fought the Russians during a war in Afghanistan for many years, and he'd been fighting the United States for several years. So uh, he knew that there, the U.S eavesdropped on communication, so he never used it for making uh, oh, operational oh, we didn't plans. Make any he would call his, oh, his mother on it, he would right. call other people. They were able to establish a, um, a sort of a network mm. of people he called, but if he was going to blow up the embassies or something, he never said it over the telephone. So they never got much out of that. And then there's a famous uh, call they intercepted the day before 9-11, but they didn't translate until the day after 9-11. That's not one of their proudest moments. No, again, yeah, and uh, that was two phone calls that NSA intercepted. They actually got the phone calls on September 10th. And they were very intriguing. One of them said something like, um, uh, tomorrow is the big day, something like that. They were, it's somewhat ambiguous, but something big was going to happen. Um, and uh, uh, they got it in September 10th. It wasn't translated that day, and then the next day, uh, the next morning is when September 11th happened, and it wasn't until the following day when they started going through all the traffic that they discovered these two. It later turned out that uh, uh, they determined that those two phone calls didn't have anything to do with September 11th. No, they didn't, so that's not such a big thing. Uh, they had to do with the, um, the attack on no, Ahmed Massoud. No, excuse me. But let me ask you something about the NSA. Uh, we have to say you're a big fan. Generally speaking, as you were in the book, maybe, of, maybe, uh, you'll, maybe uh, you'll take back your affection. Uh, the, but anyway. Well, actually, uh, it, it's interesting how, um, how I'm perceived because in my very first book, The Puzzle Palace, I wrote, the NSA tried twice to have me uh, uh, prosecuted. Oh, they did for really? It. Yeah, oh, sure. Uh, they had the Justice Department come after me. But I never worked for NSA. I never signed any clearances. I never, you know, I was an outsider writing on NSA, so there was nothing the Justice Department could do. But they did try twice to have me prosecuted. On the second book I wrote on NSA called Body of Secrets, uh, it was a reversal, and they actually had a book signing for me at NSA. So somewhere between the two uh, uh, is probably well, where let me I ask, am. Let me, you've got a, a really interesting set of facts in there. The amount of uh, cell phones calls in the last decade up 50 times. Uh, net users, people using the net, up 90 times. Uh, the billions of international phone calls reflecting our digital international global society up three times to up to a hundred billion. Mm. Now the NSA is supposed to be useful in getting information from those communication sources, but isn't the NSA really obsolete? It just can't do its job, can it? Well, a lot of people uh, think it's, uh, I mean, the, the term they use is NSA is going deaf. Um, for a number of reasons. One of them is that during the Cold War, things were fairly static. You can uh, they knew all the bases in the Soviet Union and the, and the satellite countries. They knew where the bases were, the Army bases, the Air Force, the Navy bases. And these places communicated all the time over the same frequencies, and NSA didn't have any problem eavesdropping on those. Um, 
the problem with Al Qaeda is uh, today uh, somebody's in Kenya, tomorrow they're in Kuala Lumpur, the next day the one, they're, the, the they're one in person is L he's Lahore, moving Pakistan. around. That's right, yeah. and and they're not you can't catch them. And they're not all on the same frequencies. Right. They're using a right. ca uh, calling card which is untraceable, or they'll use a cell phone right. for one week and then get rid of it, or they'll call from a payphone. So the so, only the only way we're going to catch we're going to catch these guys, it seems to me, the way we used to when everything was up on the satellite phone. Because they're moving around all the all well, over. occasionally by luck. That's by the, luck they, they did catch uh, not, it's not a Khalid Sheikh Mohammed uh, yeah. by using a cell phone because he, right. got, he got lazy and, and right. uh, so he cannot say they can't. But, but we haven't caught Bin Laden. We haven't caught yeah. a lot of people. The answer has got to be we're going to have to catch them with human beings mm. who are going to turn them in. Right. And we can find out where they are and we can take whatever action is necessary. So that's a segue to the CIA which is the agency that has the human beings that are going to chase these uh, these people. Now, in the CIA, you have a rather outrageous statement in it. You say, basically, the CIA has blood on its hands with respect to 9-11. Why is that? Yeah, I don't know if I actually use those words, but uh, I think is, that, is that the actual quote? Well, what did you think he said? Well, the, the CIA does, uh, I don't know if I was that graphic, but the CIA <laughs> was, uh, uh, certainly uh, ha has a lot of blame for uh, oh, what you said blood. No, I, I, okay. promise, I promise okay. you said blood. All right. Uh, one of my more vivid moments, I guess. Um, I might have been quoting somebody else, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the dictionary? <laughs> uh, Go ahead. I'm using yeah, here. I'm looking at the blood. Writing, but but um, I'll take your word for it, Jim. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah, the CIA has a lot to blame because um, um, one thing in particular, as you mentioned, uh, the CIA is responsible for one thing in particular, and that's human intelligence, sending agents out into the field to gather intelligence. But the CIA didn't do that uh, with regard to Al Qaeda, and it didn't do that with regard to uh, to Iraq. Uh, for Al Qaeda, for example, um, even though the CIA has 280 million people in the United States to go out and see if they can recruit somebody that, that right. might fit the part, um, the CIA never. Not only did the CIA never infiltrate Al Qaeda, the CIA never tried to infiltrate Al Qaeda because they kept saying that Al-Qaeda is too hard to infiltrate, it's too dangerous to, um, to infiltrate, and we don't have the right people to infiltrate it. But John Lynn Walker infiltrated. John, John Lynn Walker and seven other Americans. And now, uh, you know, I just, we just uh, heard about this Australian who's going on trial now down in uh, uh, Cuba. Uh, he got in. Uh, Why couldn't the CIA Well, know? that's the big question. That was the question I asked. Uh, this was their job. I mean, it was really their only job after the Cold War was penetrating terrorist organizations. And um, they never, uh, and the, the, the bad part was, and, I, and this is George Tenet saying this, the CIA saying this, um, Al-Qaeda was too hard, too dangerous. They never even tried to penetrate it. So what they would do instead was they, they got some uh, some sort of leftover mujahideen who had fought the Soviets during uh, the Cold War 20 years earlier, um, and uh, from Afghanistan, and and put them at a at a um, uh, they actually bought a like a vineyard in, in Afghanistan and had them live on a vineyard, and supposedly they were going off uh, tracking Bin Laden. Well, and all the time they never found Bin Laden. They never were able to. to uh, get any good beat on them, uh, and they tried using the Pakistani intelligence service. But these well, are the same people that can't help, trust the Pakistanis. Well, they were the to same people this. that helped set up the yeah, Taliban. Yeah, they set up the. But so, you know, so they tried those two things, and they tried giving money to Ahmed Massoud, who was head of the Northern Alliance. Hmm. At the time, he only controlled 10 percent of the country. I mean, how was he going to recapture the country? So, they tried all these sort of ridiculous covert operations without ever trying to do what John Walker Lynn did, you know, which was infiltrate. People think that uh, CIA agents are, uh, what, like James Bond or something? Uh, they got a patch over their eye. But basically, they're uh, younger, Ivy League graduates, many of them, who go to the embassy, let's say in uh, Iraq, if in the old days when we had relations, or Iran, same point, or Saudi Arabia, where we do. Yeah. I mean, some guy might even look That's like right, a younger yeah. version of younger version of me, and I don't look like exactly. Them. But I don't look like a CIA agent. But they're CIA agents, and they go to embassy parties, 
This is according to James Bamford. Well, that's right. According to James Bamford well, in his book here. And what do they do? They shake yeah. hands and have a drink and they listen. Is that what our? Is that what's going on? Well, through, uh, that's how it worked during the Cold War. Yeah. Uh, because that, that's how it did work. You, the idea was to go to these cocktail parties, and try to recruit your opposite number. You know, tell the Soviet minister of uh, of uh, or so Soviet deputy minister. Uh, of whatever that uh, life in the United States is very good, and we can uh, you can have a good life there. Try to recruit them to be a, an agent. So um, the problem was after the Cold War, the CIA's training camp, it's known as uh, the Farm, down in uh, uh, Virginia. It's like the Farm. It's like the Yankees. The Yankees are a farm a team for different. the Red Sox. Yeah. Some people think, <laughs> right? And this is called the uh, the CIA's training school. is called the Farm for their covert operations. And uh, I, again, I interviewed a lot of people uh, who went in uh, a few years before September 11th, during September 11th, and after, right after September 11th. And the problem was, all the courses were being taught by these old cool warriors. Um, and they were being taught the old cool warrior uh, tricks, like how to bump into somebody at a cocktail party, and things like that. And the people that were being taught looked just like you and me. They looked like they just came from a you know, a Harvard football game or something like that. I mean, they didn't look the part, they didn't sound the part, and they weren't learning uh, uh, what needed to be learned. What they should have been learning was exactly what John Walker Lynn uh, did, was he studied the Koran, he learned Arabic, he went to Yemen, he, he, he began uh, building up his Arabic over there, he went to Pakistan, went to one of the madrasas, the religious schools, spent a few months over there, he's establishing his bona fides, from there, he went to one of these um, um, guerrilla training camps uh, to fight the, um, I think he was going to be fighting the, uh, um, in, uh, in uh, Kashmir. Uh, and then after he went through that training course, he said he didn't want to go to Kashmir, he wanted to go to Afghanistan. He went to Afghanistan and uh, it, he, he applied to the Taliban and the Taliban said, well, uh, your local dialects, uh, Dari and, and uh, Pashtun are not good enough. but." Right down the street, there's this group called Al Qaeda, uh, and your Arabic is good, so they'll probably take you. So he went down the street, applied at Al Qaeda. It took him about 45 minutes. They accepted him. Within a day, he was on a bus to a training camp. Do you think that? I mean, this is a colossal failure of, of thinking. This program is about the digital age. It theoretically has been going on so long. I've been getting long in the tooth that's been going on so long that the usage of computers has, in, has increased. Yeah. Do you think that uh, what happened was that we had this huge revolution maybe that's going on in our lives and the communications and anything, anytime there's a revolution in our lives, it has a dark side historically on uh, creating crime, terror, ability to create more war. Do you think that everyone was just sort of looking backwards and not looking forwards in, in the NSA and the CIA? It just well, became moribund, whereas industry, all these young kids are making money, but meanwhile, back at the farm, nothing's happening? I mean, in terms of realizing what's going on? Well, in terms of technology, uh, the first place, uh, the terrorists are using technology. Uh, this guy, uh, Reed, who, who was, uh, became known as a shoe bomber, you remember? Yes, I do. Um, uh, I write about him in my book, and uh, uh, because he wasn't really looked into very much, uh, but I looked into him quite a bit in uh, a pretext for war. And it was interesting because um, in the time before he actually boarded that plane where he was going to light his shoe on fire, and it was a very sophisticated bomb actually. They had taken this, uh, this uh, shoe and they took these, uh, the sole off, and it was one of these mountain climbing, climbing shoes that had these little spaces in it and they filled all the different spaces with this plastic explosive and put the uh, fuse yeah. up through the sole. Yeah, not so easy to do. No, and then he's actually and watching. And furthermore, they had all the plans, all his plans were in a, in a computer. That's right, Which yeah. the Wall Street Journal find. But he was using, he would communicate by going to uh, um, uh, these um, internet cafes, uh, internet cafes yeah. in, in Europe yeah. and so forth. And a lot of technology. Let's get to the $64 question now. I want to know, if in fact the intelligence agencies were abused. Can you tell me how they were abused, if they were abused, were they abused? Oh, they definitely were, were, were Why were they abused? abused? And who abused them, and who's responsible? Well, the, uh, this is the way it worked. The, uh, when the Bush administration came into office, they came into office with two key things on their mind. 
Uh, and those two key things were, were the, the two items, the only two items that were discussed in the very first National Security Council meeting on January 30th, 2001. And the former Secretary of, uh, of the Treasury talks all about this. Um, the two items was... That's O'Neill. Yeah, uh, Paul O'Neill. And um, he said that uh, the two items were uh, becoming closer to Errol Sharon in Israel, becoming further away, and at the same time becoming further away uh, from the uh, Oslo Peace Accords. Okay. And the second item was uh, they had George Tennant in there with a uh, director of central intelligence with all his maps of Iraq, right. looking for reasons to right. bomb Iraq. So right. those were the two items. And uh, as soon as September 11th happened, uh, in Rumsfeld's own notes, he writes down, or his aide wrote down, uh, look for a way to bring uh, okay. Saddam Hussein into this. All right. So. Uh, you establish the fact that this was what the administration wanted to wanted to do, okay? Right. Mm -hmm. But now, how do you get to the next step? That uh, even though they wanted to do that, yeah. Uh, which let's just concede, there may be people you know who wouldn't agree with you on that. But let's just say for the moment, somebody not agreeing with yeah, me. Yeah, that's possible. That'd be the someone. first time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we agree on that point. But how do you take the next step to show that, even if that's so, that the agencies were abused? What, I mean, prove it to me. How do you know? Well, it's all in testimony. The, the, what, what happened was that, um, uh, first of all, the Pentagon, as I mentioned, was, uh, uh, you have the neoconservatives in the Pentagon that had this predetermined... Neoconservative means what? Uh, it's somebody who, uh, who beyond the conservatives, uh, the neoconservatives, uh, uh, you know, take 10 minutes to explain the whole right. history of neoconservatism, but basically these are people who want an activist United States okay, who go fine. out That's fine. Uh, That's, preemptive yeah. right. wars right. Uh, uh, where they consider Israel right. to be preeminent right. in their interests and um, uh, they're very focused on uh, on uh, uh, being a, having United States become an aggressive country okay. around the world. Uh, uh, the uh, Pre, uh, the, the invasion of Iraq is a perfect example. So um, you have these people in the Pentagon who were uh, uh, sort of, that was... That's what they wanted to do. For, okay. for, for a long period of time, right. right. Now the CIA was not going along with their, their uh, agenda. Their agenda was Iraq after September 11th. They're the neocons. The neocons. And the, and the uh, and, CIA, and which is supposed to be liberal, well, it's not liberal. It's yeah. it's uh, it's objective. I, I certainly wouldn't call them all liberals yeah. out there. Okay. Uh, but um, what they are, are, are they're not politicals. They don't. Right. They weren't uh, pulled out of some uh, right wing think tank right. in in Washington, which is what the Pentagon people were. Yeah. Uh, the CIA people graduated from college, at you know twenty years ago, or whatever, right. and they joined the CIA and they worked their way up in the ranks. They're not attached to a political party necessarily. Uh, so um, the CIA was saying we don't have evidence showing that right. Iraq is uh, right. number one linked to Al Qaeda right. and number two has right. weapons of mass destruction. That's not what the Pentagon wanted the White right. House okay, to hear. So, okay, so then what happens? So then the Pentagon says we're going to set up our own little intelligence unit, and that's what they did. And that, so okay. they would pick out they would pick okay. out all this distorted intelligence. Okay, so that's an abuse abuse of intelligence, okay? That's right, yeah. Okay, but I want to know how the CIA was abused. Well, the CIA has analysts, and they, they come up with an analysis based on uh, logic and experience and, and all their capable skills. Um, that's what the taxpayers are paying for. That's why right. it was set up by Harry Truman, to right. be a central intelligence agency, right. not a partisan intelligence agency. So... Uh, the Pentagon, which actually controls 85% of the intelligence. Right. The CIA doesn't. Right. The Pentagon does. The CIA basically told the rest of the government, including the White House, don't pay attention to the CIA right. when they're telling you this. Pay attention to what we're giving you. Right. And their information was all slanted. It was based on stuff from Ahmed Chalabi, right. uh, who the CIA didn't trust. That was one of the big well, hang okay. <laughs> The so CIA when, was when there Trump anyone in the CIA who uh, said that uh, effectively they were supposed to turn out the party line that you came across? Yeah, there were a number of people. That the pressure was uh, was enormous. Uh, one of the people I interviewed uh, uh, said that uh, they were called to this meeting with uh, uh, other people in their in their unit, and the unit was uh, assigned to find weapons of mass destruction in uh, in in Iraq. 
And so yeah, uh, see if I get your point then on the CIA and uh, Cheney made. Uh, but I haven't said what the person was told. The person was told, or the group was told. Look, oh, I'm uh, sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, if the president wants a war, it's your job to come up with a reason for him to go to war. That's not the purpose of the CIA. But that's what they were told. This person was ready to quit right at that moment when, when they heard that. So do you think they were told that by the, the government or to the CIA? I'm trying to figure out who's at fault here. In other words, I started to say before you yeah. had a chance to finish, did Cheney actually go over there and force them to turn out the stuff that turned out to be wrong? I mean, No, Cheney, right? Cheney never put a gun to anybody's head and said, you got to change your report this way. What was happening, and you don't, in a you know, sophisticated uh, agency, you don't have to have somebody put a gun to your head. What you have to do is know that you want to go for your next promotion, and that the people who are getting promoted are the people who are coming right. up with the, uh, with the party line, and the party line being, um, uh, we want to find uh, uh, as much uh, 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 bad news about Iraq as possible. So we don't want to see the good just news. resist the pressure? Uh, you know, George Tenet did resist it for a while, and, and this is what happened. Uh, if you look at George Tenet, again, this is all in the, in the record. Um, George Tenet uh, uh, was resisting the, the CIA up until, uh, resisting the White House up until about October of 2002. Um, the uh, White House wanted to put into the president's uh, speech in Cincinnati, his first big right. speech on, on Iraq. Um, information about how Saddam was trying to get right. uranium from Niger to build up his nuclear capabilities. Um, the CIA was saying that information is not reliable. It was based on these phony documents right. that were being bandied around. Uh, so the tenant actually called up the White House, the National Security Council, and said, look, um, that information is not reliable. You shouldn't put it in there. And they took it out. But he had a battle of the White House. And George Tenet was not a battler. He, was, uh, he wanted to get along with these people. That was the last time he fought the White House. So the White House wanted to put it in again on the President's State of the Union uh, address in January 2003. And this time, Tenet not only didn't fight the White House, he didn't even bother reading the State of the Union address. Can you imagine the second? The, the OK, so now we come to the end. Yeah. Were the intelligence agencies abused? Answer? Definitely. Yes. And who do we blame? We blame the, the, the Pentagon, the White House, uh, the people who were uh, pushing the, the war in Iraq. And, and, uh, so we blame the White House for, the, for what the CIA did, basically. Well, as Harry that's Truman said, that's where the buck, where the buck stops. stops. It's the key people that were Jim involved Bamford. were the Pentagon people. Thanks, thanks for <laughs> stopping by. My pleasure, Jim. Come back again soon. <laughs> I will. Thank you, Jim. And you too come back soon and learn more about the digital age. For the digital age, I am. James Goodale, good night.